session, I would like to invite Dr. Rajay Sinha to initiate the session. Over to you, Doctor. Thank you, and uh, a very good afternoon to all of you. We would uh, like to start this session. This session is basically on keratoconus, wherein uh, you know so many things, so many controversies, so many uh, decision making has to be done, and that is why the the heading of this. Uh, this session is decision making in management of keratoconus. So we begin with the first speaker, and the first speaker is Dr. Vijay Kumar Sharma, Colonel Sharma, who will speak about uh, the indications like CXL, when to do and when not to do. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. So my screen is visible. Yes. Yes. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'll be discussing should all keratoconic corneas be cross-linked. I'll be talking about some techniques which are available and then in the end I'll be discussing some case-based scenarios uh, about the various keratoconus patients for cross-linking. So uh, historically if we see uh, the collagen cross-linking was first time described uh, in the Technical University of uh, Dresden in Germany and by Wollensack et al. in 2003, hence it came to known as uh, Dresden Protocol. Uh, now what are the principles of uh, collagen cross-linking? In uh, corneal ectasias, the cross links between the adjacent collagen fibers are fewer. So this uh, uh, leads to ectasia in the long term. So we need to, uh, in this technique, after uh, debriding the epithelium in the uh, conventional technique, uh, the cornea is saturated using a riboflavin dye uh, for about 30 minutes, followed by UVA radiation of 370 nanometer uh, 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 for a variable duration, depending upon the protocol to be followed. This results in increase in number of crosslinks over a period of time. And uh, uh, this leads to strengthening of the corneal tissues and it stops for the progression of corneal ectasias. Now, what are the various indications for collagen crosslinking? Uh, the indications are ectasias as well as some non-ectatic disorders in the ectasias, primary ectasias like keratoconus and pellucid marginal degenerations and post lesic ectasia in the secondary ectasias, they are uh, there the cross collagen cross-linking is done. Uh, in non-ectatic uh, disorders, infectious keratitis, bullous keratopathy, chemical injuries, anterior marginal degenerations are some of the indications, although the uh, evidence for uh, uh, performing collagen cross-linking in these is small, but uh, uh, this is being done. Uh, what are the various protocols? These could be the conventional protocols, accelerated protocols, and uh, iontophoresis. In the conventional techniques, uh, the conventional Dresden protocol where the epithelium epi of uh, collagen cross-linking is done, then there may be epi on uh, collagen cross-linking. In the accelerated, we have a continuous or a pulsed accelerated uh, collagen cross-linking. Uh, when should we do the cross-linking? So in keratoconus patients, uh, uh, the corneal thickness should be more than 400 micron for isosmolar collagen cross-linking, uh, whereas uh, if the corneal thickness is uh, uh, above uh, 350 micron to 400 micron, we can go ahead with a hyposmolar collagen cross-linking. In the children, usually uh, where there is an early onset of keratoconus, they are at a higher risk of collagen cross-linking failures. Uh, so in these uh, uh, patients, uh, we may not uh, wait for the keratoconus uh, uh, progression to be documented and we may go ahead uh, uh, with the collagen crosslinking at an earlier stage if the risk factors are high. Usually they require to be done under GA and a frequent post of follow-up is required in these patients. Now uh, there is no consensus uh, as such till now uh, about the keratoconus progression. Various criteria have been uh, described from time to time like in the Dresden uh, protocol in 2003 uh, increase in Kmax by more than one diopter patient self-report of uh, deteriorating visual acuity and need of new contact lens fitting more than once in two years were, were taken as a keratoconus progression. Uh, Hirsch et al. in 2011 uh, gave the keratoconus criteria as follows. Increase of more than one diopter in the steep K, increase of more than one diopter in the manifest cylinder and increase of more than 0.5 diopter in spherical equivalent, uh, one, of, uh, one or more of the following in over two uh, two years period. Uh, so they took this as a keratoconus pro uh, progression criteria. Similarly, Mezota et al. in 2014 also described some criteria and Gomes et al. in 2015 gave uh, a bit more generalized criteria uh, as they said that no specific values can be given because they considered that uh, these values are specific for each device. So they gave three criteria. So any consistent change in 
at least two of these criteria should be there. These include progressive steepening of anterior corneal surface and progressive steepening of posterior corneal surface, progressive thinning and are increase in rate of corneal thickness change from periphery to the thinnest point. They also kept one open-ended criteria uh, which stated that uh, collagen cross-linking could be indicated uh, if there is a perceived risk of progression if the progression is not documented. Uh, so which one is better, epi on or epi off? Uh, uh, the evidence goes in favor of epi off. Epi on has got some advantages like it avoids post op pain. Uh, it also avoids infectious keratitis and pigment epithelial detachment, uh, which may be some uh, uh, rare complications in epi off. But the efficacy is poor. One study found that there is only one fifth of biochemical stiffening uh, compared to Dresden protocol in epi on technique uh, and because of unreliable penetration of riboflavin. Now, standard or accelerated? Now, uh, uh, Three major studies have been done comparing the uh, standard protocol and accelerated. One, Canelopolis in 2012, uh, they found no difference between the Dresden protocol and accelerated uh, collagen cross-linking. Uh, Dr. Shetty et al. in 2015, uh, they compared the Dresden protocol with accelerated uh, cross-linking by using 9, 18, and 30 milliwatt per centimeter square criteria. And they found that Dresden showed better flattening effect compared to accelerated one. And they found that out of the accelerated, the 9 milliwatt per centimeter square for 10 minutes was better than other two. In Midros et al. in 2016, uh, they did a one-year follow-up and they found that Accelerated corneal cross-linking is safe and effective, but flattening effect is less than Dresden protocol. Now, uh, with accelerated, some other problems uh, uh, and uh, some other factors came into play. Uh, one was supplemental oxygen. So, uh, adequate oxygen is must in stroma for cross-linking to, to happen. So, high irradiance with shorter radiation time may lead to higher oxygen consumption, as in cases of accelerated. So, uh, a supplemental oxygen is being studied. Uh, many uh, researchers are studying this and uh, uh, results are still in the uh, primitive stage. Uh, then uh, accelerated can be performed by either a continuous uh, irradiation or a pulsed uh, uh, irradiation. Now, pulsing of UV light during collagen cross-linking, again, it allows reoxygenation uh, during the pauses in the expo exposure. So, again, this is being in the this is being studied by many researchers. There are few uh, uh, few articles which are available in the literature, but uh, still no definitive conclusions can be drawn. Iontophoresis is another technique where uh, epithelium is not removed and a low intensity electric current is uh, uh, passed uh, through the cornea by using two electrodes. It allows uh, riboflavin penetration through the epithelium, non-invasive technique, better saturation than epion uh, approach. Again, uh, much more effective than epithelium without this, and, uh, uh, but inferior to standard Dresden protocol. Now, uh, I'll just take one more minute. Uh, what if there is no documented progression? Now, this patient in the right eye had a corneal hydrops, in the left eye, the keratoconus is there. Uh, so, should we wait for any documenting progression? Uh, no, not in such cases where there is a, a hydrops in the other eye, if, uh, a adverse event has already taken place. So, we should go ahead with the uh, collagen cross linking in the other eye. Other eye status in this, as you can see in the left eye, the pachymetry was 399 and steep Q was 48. Uh, this is a pentacam image of another patient where the K-max is 67 and thinnest spec is 355. So again, we will not wait uh, uh, for documenting progression, keratoconus progression, because then it will go beyond the range of uh, collagen cross-linking. So we'll go ahead with the collagen cross-linking in this case. Now, in this case, right eye and left eye, you can see the pachymetry is 515 and K-max is also not very high. So here we can wait six months uh, repeating the pentacam uh, or uh, any tomograph and uh, then document progression and then go ahead with the uh, with the cross-linking if required. Uh, this is my last uh, case. Uh, this is a uh, Cyrus photograph. In the right eye, 428 is the uh, pachymetry. In the left eye, 376. But Kmax values are very high, 71 and 76. So in this left eye, uh, uh, collagen cross-linking immediately and since k-max value is very high so similarly for the right eye we should go ahead with the collagen cross-linking thank you thank you dr vijay for a uh, very nice coverage of uh, of uh, what are the indications and wherein we should not wait uh, wherein we should not think about uh, you know documented documentation of progression we will have the uh, discussion in the end, and uh, now we move to the cross-linking in thin corneas. And uh, uh, 
Sorry. Uh, yeah. So I'll be uh, discussing about cross-linking in in Karnias, which I'm not able to share. What happened? Uh, we can see it now. Sir, sir, can please see. first of all open your PPT, then share, sir. Yeah, I had opened it, but it was not showing. That's why I did this. Sir, please minimize the your window, sir. Okay. Shall I? Just okay. Click it on, click share screen, sir. But from where I'm, uh, I cannot see the, uh, I cannot see this. It never happens. Why it's happening now? Sir, please close other applications you open now. Only we okay. open your PPT, sir. Okay, I have closed the other PPTs. Now. Rajesh, close all the other PPTs and I hope you are not an end show of your last presentation. No, 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 it's fine. I have closed other PPTs and then now it's... You can see it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please put on slides also. Done it. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah. So I'll be talking about corneal cross-linking and thin corneas. Now, uh, as Dr. Vijay was mentioning, the corneal thickness should at least be 400 microns in order to uh, have uh, a safe... Uh, uh, corneal cross-linking. Otherwise, if the corneal thickness is less than 400 microns, then there's risk of UV toxicity to endothelium. So it is very essential to understand this thing that the corneal thickness should be more than 400 microns. Uh, or if it's less than 400 microns, there are certain efforts, certain ways, certain methods, certain innovations that have been uh, done to you know, increase the distance of endothelium from the ocular surface over which the UV rays are focused. So one of these is use of hypoosmolar riboflavin, wherein 0.1% riboflavin and 0.9% saline is used. Another method is use of bandage contact lens. Another method is use of smile lenticule and then use of intrastomal lenticule. So the purpose is to increase the gap, increase the you know, gap between the UV rays and the endothelium. Now, hypoosmolar riboflavin uh, has been used and it is still being used as the most uh, commonly used modality for thin corneas. And uh, in this, uh, as I said, 0.1% uh, riboflavin and 0.9% saline is used. And uh, there are certain studies which have been done and they have found out that uh, uh, the the procedure is free of endothelial toxicity. There's no endothelial toxicity. Uh, the, uh, if the cornea has to be at least 330 microns, it should be more than 330 microns in order to swell it enough so that the gap is 400 microns. And the CXL with hypoosmolar riboflavin is not as effective. So this is finally the punchline that it is not as effective as a conventional cross-linking. However, it has some effect and it is... Uh, still one of the most commonly used modalities in thin corneas. Then uh, Jacob et al, they uh, described the methodology of contact lens assisted CXL. What they did was they put a uh, contact lens, soft contact lens over the cornea so that the gap between the cornea, between the UV rays, which were focused on the contact lens and the endothelium increased. And that's how they could save the endothelium. However, uh, they noted that the pre-corneal riboflavin film, which is the uh, which is behind the contact lens, which collects, it decreased the UV irradiance at stromal surface, and it also decreased oxygen diffusion uh, through the cornea. So, both, uh, due to both of these, it decreased the CXL efficacy, and that is why uh, there are very few people, and there's hardly anyone who prefers doing it. Then another technique was described by Sisdev et al. wherein they used the smile lenticule. They placed the smile lenticule on the corneal surface. Uh, first, they put riboflavin in the cornea, uh, debrided it, put riboflavin, put a smile lenticule, and then that's how they increased the gap between the endothelium and, and the UV rays. And there was no uh, 
no uh, collection of fluid between the lenticule and the corneal surface. And that is how they said that it is quite effective. However, it was just a, a case series of three cases and it is still not a very uh, you know, uh, valid uh, uh, technique and not very, very much used technique. Then people have used, uh, you know, intrastomal implantation of uh, lenticule to increase the gap and also to strengthen the cornea. So human corneal donor tissue has been used, bioengineered cornea has been used, and uh, and we have also done a study at RP Center wherein uh, we took patients who were less than 400 microns, between 350 to 400 microns. Then an intrastomal pocket was created with femtosecond laser and riboflavin was used for two minutes. A negative meniscus lenticule was implanted using the donor lenticule, 200 microns was cut, the central part was ablated four millimeter, and a seven millimeter lenticule was implanted, and accelerated cross-linking was done. So I'll just show you a small clip regarding this. So uh, this is a case of a keratoconus wherein femtosecond laser was used to create uh, the plane, and a side cut after that. And then uh, this plane was dissected. Dissection was done. And uh, once the plane was dissected fully, then riboflavin was instilled into the, uh, into the, this uh, tunnel in the, in, the, in the track. And then uh, uh, we waited for a couple of minutes the lenticule created by the by a donor lenticule was also put in riboflavin for a couple of minutes and then this seven this is a 7 millimeter lenticule which is uh, being introduced to the pocket intrastromally and uh, once uh, it was introduced then uh, riboflavin was put over the corneal surface as well. We could see by slit that uh, there is no folding of the edge. And then uh, uh, UV rays, uh, accelerated cross-linking was done. Uh, and uh, that was the end of it. This is the look that we got on day one. But then with time, since there was a stromal thickening, with time it decreased. So I just want to tell you a little bit about the uh, outcome of the study. There were 11 eyes of 10 patients with progressive keratoconus. Thinnest pachymetry was 320 to, uh, the pachymetry that we took was 320 to 400 microns. They were all intolerant to RGP contact lens. 12 month follow-up was done. Ectasia progression was halted till the last follow-up. You could see that. The, the mean K-max decreased by 4.1 diopters. And the mean thinnest pachymetry uh, increased by 83 microns at one year. And uh, the uncorrected visual acuity also improved significantly as well as the best corrected visual acuity. All the patients were fitted contactless successfully. Uh, there was reactivation of viral keratitis in one which was treated. There was a small epithelial ingrowth at the periphery uh, in one case, which was innocuous, which uh, did not require any management. And there was one case with a posterior lenticular interface fibrosis, which did decrease the visual acuity after the haze happened. Now, this is the uh, post-op maximum keratometry, which went on reducing till the last follow-up of one year. This means that this does require a little bit more of follow-up. Maybe uh, we would like to follow up these patients. Uh, maybe in further follow-ups, it may flatten further. We can't say. We can just uh, you know, hope and speculate. Now, as far as the lenticule thickness is concerned, it reduced because it was edematous first, and then it stabilized at three months and it did not decrease after that. So uh, we thought that, uh, we concluded that this was a good technique, uh, but it, it is a small sample size, so we can't say that. And we are right now, initially we used seven millimeter lenticule. Now we are increasing it to 8.5 millimeter lenticule. And I've just done a couple of cases. The results are slightly better. There's better flattening. I'll just take half a minute. There's slightly better flattening, but uh, since the sample size is too less because of COVID, everything was halted. So we could not further go ahead with that. 
people have done trans epithelial cxl also in cases wherein the total thickness is about 400 microns if they divide then it will reduce further so they tried trans epithelial cxl but the results were not as effective uh, these are some of the studies which have shown that ep off definitely has better result then Kimionis group, they did custom epithelial debridement in these thin corneas. What they did was that they left the epithelium over the thinnest part and debrided the surrounding part. But what they found out that the riboflavin did not penetrate in the area where the epithelium was not debrided and the demarcation line was not visible in that area. So in conclusion, uh, uh, this uh, CXL, of course, is an established modality to arrest progression in keratoconus. In thin corneas, we are still learning how to improve and how to get a better technique. And uh, in our study, we found out that intrastomal lenticule assisted CXL shows some promise, but it requires further study to really understand or really establish this technique as one of the techniques, uh, useful techniques for thin corneas. Thank you very much for your patient listening. And now I would like to invite Dr. JK Reddy for his presentation on customizing CXL and phakic implants for visual rehabilitation. You are mute, Dr. Reddy. Sir, please share your slides. Yes. Visible? Yes. Yeah, visible. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rajeshina, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, uh, it's my pleasure to be in this uh, forum along with you and the eminent speakers. Uh, to, to talk about my concepts and uh, working on CXL for the past more than a decade. So what we learned in the cross-linking. As uh, nicely explained by Dr. Vijay Sharma, uh, the uh, cross-links are physical bonds. What we have to remember is there Can is a just be a little louder, Dr. Reddy? Yeah, there is a, this is a physical bond, though uh, there is a chemical cross-linking also, but it's not practiced in uh, cornea very much. So these bonds, whatever is formed, do not from the riboflavin, this is our covalent bonds formed by the uh, super oxygen molecules. These three gentlemen changed the way the, the um, catoconus is practiced around the world and uh, hundreds of thousands of patients benefited out of them. And not only patients, we also benefit a lot in handling our patients both uh, professionally and financially. So coming to this 5.4, a magic number, it's calculated for the tissue. So the more uh, taking into consideration 450 microns corneal thickness, if the cornea is less, you need a less energy. And uh, that's uh, another point we need to remember. So the spiral has given a graph to adjust the powers for thin corneas, as Dr. Rajeshna has nicely explained everything, to reduce the toxicity and reduce the amount of UV radiation to the endothelium and to the stroma also to prevent excess one. So why should we customize? For example, this patient is very, uh, I'll show you an example, 2007, December, he had a cross-linking done. In, so 2010 is beautiful. His vision has improved, unaided, and he is very nice. 2012, there is a flattening and his vision started dropping. 2012, December, so these are the graphs. Or 2015, 2000, 2017, when it comes after 10 years, his vision is dropped to 618 from somewhere between 66. So this is what happens in uh, cross-linking sometimes when you, that's why we, uh, we started practicing cross. This is another example of this patient, 2008, 2008 after cross-linking, very nice vision. Then 2008, December, fine. 2010, excess flattening, excess flattening. And this is what generally we see the haziness of the cornea after cross-linking. We don't want to see this haziness because the haziness has nothing to do with immediately with the cross-link. Cross-links are invisible phenomena. So whatever we see is due to the UV radiation toxicity. So this demarcation line is how much is the UV radiation toxicity it shows. That's what I believe. It doesn't show the cross-links. It just shows the toxicity. Why should customize? This cornea, if you look at the superior cornea is already flat. We don't want to flatten further. And the inferior cornea is only the cone. This is a paracentral cone. This is a central cone. And this is a almost symmetrical bow tie, little bit asymmetrical bow tie. And this is a totally inferior cone. And this is a very early cat catacornus. 
So all this, this is a superior catechol. So if you do the same thing for every patient, it doesn't make sense in my uh, view. So, so we started customizing cost linking, depending upon the uh, what we can customize is the issue in a standard OI equipment. The total amount of energy is variable. We can always change it. The size of the beam is always fixed at eight, eight millimeters. We can change according to our uh, patients and the location where we apply the UV radiation, we can change and we can add on PTK or PRK for these cases. Then how do you customize? This all depends upon the what you believe, what you interpret from the available information and the knowledge, technical knowledge and assumption and hypothesis. So there is always two sides for the coin. The, some people believe cataconus is a local weakness, progress to become global, that's what I believe. But there is opposite argument, cataconus is a global disease, it just starts in one local area, so you need a total corneal treatment, that's what another group believes. So the steepest cornea is the weakest area, that's what I believe, and it can be irrespective of the thinnest location. It can be anywhere, that's what we found in our uh, Pentacam maps. The thinnest location is not always the steepest portion, whereas uh, some, the opposite group believes the thinnest location is the weakest point, and the elevation, what we see in Pentacam is just a consequence of biomechanical effect. I believe the strengthening of the weak and the steepest area strengthens the cornea and prevents further progression. And the opposite view is catoconus is a progressive global disease. So the wide area of standard treatment is necessary to prevent the disease. So there is another point. Normal tissue doesn't cross-link with treatment. Only biomechanically weak tissue with the weak cross-links only takes up extra cross-links. That's uh, one uh, group, one point of view. I believe that all tissue develops crosslink irrespective of the status at this point of time. So we did a preliminary work. For example, we took a normal 50 years to 60 years donor corneas, which are well, or normal corneas, not catoconus. Then we did a crosslink with CXL, glutaraldehyde and BSS, then subjected to them to a KOH digestion. Uh, two hours, the uncrosslinking tissue disappeared whereas CXL tissue is still remaining, glutaraldehyde is still remaining. It took four hours for the cross-linking tissue to dissolve. So it definitely shows the normal tissue also undergoes cross-linking after treatment. And in tensile strength also, measurements also we did in a uh, engineering lab. So it has shown after cross-linking immediately within few hours after cross-linking, there is an increased tensile strength in the, even in the normal tissue when compared with uncross-linked tissue. So these are all, I believe that visual acuity is paramount importance and clinical parameter for success of treatment. But the opposite, some group uh, very uh, argue that the shape of the cornea is more important. It's not the visual acuity. K-max and corneal indices are more critical parameters. So what we can customize as I'm telling, that depending upon thickness, we can always change the energy and giving, give, as the map given by the spiral. And the visual acuity I take is a paramount importance Importance. If the visual acuity is very good, best corrected or uncorrected, I use less energy. I don't use total cross-linking because I don't want progressive flattening. Then accepting a high spectacle power, I use more energy than the recommended 5.4 joules. And if the spectacle power acceptance is very small power, I use very less, energy, say around four to five joules. This is a map irradiation map. Then the location and size, for example, a patient like this, I do only the inferior area, the superior area we cover with a uh, tissue and we cover with something, we masking a masking with a paper and we do only inferior cross-linking. Even this PMD, Pelsin marginal degeneration, we do only inferior cross-linking, we don't touch the superior cardia. Then PTK is another modality we are trying. This is apex-centered, you have to remember, this is not pupil-centered, this is apex-centered PTK. And uh, the concept behind is the thinnest, uh, epithelium is over the apex of the cornea. So usually we measured with, uh, it comes around 35 to 40 microns. So we, for example, this tissue, this patient, we apply PTK only on the inferior area. For example, you can see that the, there is a decent at PTK that happens in the only in the inferior area. So my time. So then we cross-linking that tissue alone. These are the results which you can show. The almost catacornous sky becomes normal and the asymmetric body becomes more symmetrical body. The key points here is more the time 
better the effect that's what dr rajesh sinha also showed it doesn't obey the bunsen rosecola uh, exactly visual acuity decides the treatment plan and topography of the cornea location of the cone these are the paramount importance when you take the story doesn't stop there we have new modalities of cross linking which give a mild gentle which we can start in early cases this is a rose bengal with 532 cross linking so i think i will stop with that fake maybe uh, because time is over thank you very much for giving me this opportunity thank you uh, thank you dr reddy and uh, very nice uh, concepts that you discussed with us and we will definitely have a discussion on all those and we now move on to our next speaker and that is dr swapna nair and uh, she will be talking about the intracranial ring segment with cross linking simultaneous or sequential thank you dr rajesh for having me here mm we just uh... share my screen first so i'll be talking about um, intracranial ring segments and uh, cross linking so whether they should be done simultaneously or whether uh, they should be done sequentially so now this has been i hope my screen is shared and uh, the yeah, yeah 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 so uh, so this has been a long raging debate so there's nothing uh, new in this particular debate now uh, i'm just weighing the pros and cons of each and what the studies say and uh, uh, what has been seen over the years so now by simultaneously we know it happens during the same sitting that is you implant the intracranial ring segment and this is followed by the collagen cross linking which can be accelerated or may follow the full resident protocol or it may uh, be an epithelium on uh, cross linking or uh, trans um, or uh, an epithelium of cross linking uh, sequential means you do the uh, intracranial ring segments first and then wait for some time usually at least 6 3 months before you do the uh, second procedure of um, collagen cross linking or there are the people who actually do the cross linking first and then may follow it up with uh, icrs so uh, the theory behind this is that icr is basically flattens the corneal surface and therefore uh, it uh, betters the shape of the cornea and increases the visual acuity decreases the keratometry reading but does nothing for the pathology underneath which is what is handled by the uh, uh, cxl so uh, to stabilize the cornea you need the cxl part of it and it has been postulated that when when these two are combined the effects are potentiated so when do you use this particular technique as we know we can have cxl alone you can have icrs alone you can have cxl combined with topo guided prk and of course cxl combined with icrs so it is recommended that cxl combined with icrs is used when the corrected distance visual acuity is on the worst side so if you if you have a sort of irregular cornea which you just want to smoothen off with the topographer uh, then uh, the topo guided prk is what you would choose over the icrs but when you have to flatten the cornea a lot you have a highly decentered cone that you want to bring to the center and add some tissue to the cornea then it is uh, the icrs along with cxl that is used Uh, so the basic rules of planning for this procedure is all the same as that for any general icrs you have a myopic correction with symmetrical segments and when a high astigmatic component is there you use asymmetrical segments and for oval cones you can have a single inferior segment and as uh, dr reddy has already shown the effects uh, are drastic uh, just like with cxl you can see how here uh, the the astigmatism has been grossly reduced the k values have been transformed from what was in the range of uh, 4952 to uh, 44 uh, 47 so this uh, improves the visual acuity as you can see from a best corrected of 624 parts to 66 and how the astigmatism and the spherical equivalent has uh, grossly reduced so this is how the eye looks after the procedure on the anterior and under the slit lamp now uh, the debate uh, is whether when you do a simultaneous uh, icrs and cross linking do you keep the epithelium on or take it off now they have adequate both because when you keep the epithelium on and you do an accelerated version of the cross linking the healing is faster 
So that is one of the basic things for which you do a simultaneous ICRS with CXL so that you don't need to wait for a long period in these young people who have a lot of work to do and get to uh, need to get back to their routine. So accelerated epithelium on cross-linking is advocated by a lot, but as we know, and as Dr. Rajesh had pointed out, that the effects of a trans epithelial cross-linking is not quite as good as epithelium off. Uh, the advocates of epithelium off swear by it and they are willing to take the epithelium off on a freshly implanted ICRS to do the cross-linking. So uh, by, by any of these methods, approximately five types of reduction in uh, uh, keratometry readings are seen. Now, those with epithelium on have found that in some of the cases, at least one third of the cases in this study progressed, uh, the keratoconus progressed and then later required an epithelium of CXL. So I think that speaks a lot for uh, having an epithelium of CXL in the beginning itself. Now, the second question is that suppose you're doing a sequential. Now, which order comes first? Should you do the C3R first or should you do the, uh, uh, the corneal ring segments first? Now, uh, it has been said that though CXL deals with the pathology of the cornea, and that is uh, perhaps the primary step in treatment of keratoconus, and ICRS is a supplement to flatten the extremely uh, steep cornea, it has been known and multiple studies have shown that the implantation of a corneal ring segment into an intact cornea has a greater effect, much greater flattening effect than an already cross-linked stiff cornea. So that is what is advocated that ICRs be done first and then you wait uh, for some time before you do the CXL in a sequential cornea. And the effect of CXL is also thus potentiated by the already flattened cornea uh, that has been created by the ICRS. Uh, so again, here the change in keratometry is in the range of four to five diopters. And uh, um, now, uh, now, now these were some of the issues that were plaguing the two types of uh, sequential or uh, the simultaneous uh, 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 procedures. Now, uh, now this is a study which compared simultaneous and sequential ICRS with uh, CXL. And here they, study, uh, they included 19 eyes in the simultaneous category and seven in the sequential. The ICRS used was intact and they followed the full resident protocol. Now, let me tell you that none of the studies, whether it is this one or another one that I'm going to show, had any statistically significant difference between groups. So I just picked out the clinical results and this is what it showed. So here you can see the logma change in the corrected and uncorrected uh, visual acuities and the reduction in the K max K average and the change in the inferior superior asymmetry. And as you go by the numbers, you can see that is the sequential ICRS plus CXL that seems to have a higher effect on the keratometry value, better effect on vision and uh, on the asymmetry between the inferior and superior cornea. So now this is another study which had three groups. Uh, one was simultaneous ICRS CXL. The other was uh, um, a sequential CXL ICRS. And the third was ICRS alone. Again, in this group, you can see here that there was no statistically significant differences between these groups. Again, I looked up the, uh, the clinical uh, data here. Uh, th but there's one more thing that they have mentioned that in the group that uh, underwent a sequential uh, procedure, they had seen an improvement in both the corrected and the uncorrected visual acuity in all the patients. So it was not just an average in all the patients it was seen. Now going to the clinical data in this group, uh, it was seen that it is the simultaneous, that is the single procedure ICRS CXL that happened to produce a far greater benefit. Here, here you can see that the keratometry value, if it decreased by six diopters in the simultaneous group. It decreased uh, only by four in the other group. So now these are the, such are the results of uh, various studies, you know, some that favor simultaneously and some that favor uh, sequential, but uniformly all of them mention that uh, uh, none of uh, 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 these are statistically significant, but though we can see uh... the results. I'll, I'll be take, uh, just taking a couple of seconds. So you can see here there is an ICRS happening. 
So these are through the femto pockets uh, created by the FS200. And so here the cone was central and uh, there was a steep central cornea, more of myopia than astigmatism because of which we have symmetrical uh, ring segments going on either side uh, about the uh, steep axis of astigmatism. So uh, ultimately this is sutured where uh, at the pocket so that uh, there is no extrusion of the rings. Now this is followed by uh, the CXL procedure. So here uh, you can see that this is an epithelium on procedure. And uh, so that, that is the uh, video of the procedure basically. Now, uh, fi finally, it, when, when you do a simultaneous treatment, it, it's basically the recovery time that is saved upon. Uh, and though the, uh, the protocols vary, it has been shown uh, that this may be useful in uh, working age group patients when the sitting is simultaneous, whereas in sequential, uh, there may be a more of a mechanical flattening of the cornea uh, potentiated by one procedure over the other. Uh, so uh, the, the result is that debate still rages on and there is no definite conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sapna. Uh, next, we have Dr. Namrata Sharma, who will be talking about corneal biomechanics, role in management of keratoconus. Dr. Sharma, please. So thank you, Rajesh, and thank you. My, okay, both are on. Thank you for making me a part of this uh, interesting course on keratoconus. And uh, I feel biomechanics in keratoconus is still in its infancy stage because biomechanics as such in cornea is in infancy. So when another dimension is added to it, keratoconus, then uh, we are still not there where, where we should be. So as far as the ectasias is concerned, uh, it has a role to play in primary keratoconus as well as in post lasik ectasia. And in primary keratoconus, more for early cases, because once you have keratoconus, then uh, there's not much for biomechanics to play a role. So it can be done by two instruments, either aura or by Corvus ST, and this is the aura. And uh, basically, uh, there are air pressures which correspond with two application states of the cornea, P1 and P2. And uh, you have two factors, the cornea resistance factor and the corneal hysteresis, uh, coupled with the uh, intraocular pressure, which is Goldman corrected, and the corneal compensated intraocular pressure, which has a more of a role for glaucoma uh, specialists than for us. So uh, this is the study that we did on almost uh, 100 eyes of keratoconus, and uh, this is going to be published in the American Journal, Journal of Ophthalmology, the corneal biomechanics in cases of pediatric keratoconus. And we found that positive correlation occurred between the central corneal thickness and the corneal hysteresis. And uh, uh, so uh, the uh, reduced CCT equates to the compromised corneal hysteresis. And in other studies also, it has been shown that deformation profile uh, has been shown to be different with deformation amplitude, which is more sensitive parameter in diagnosis of preclinical keratoconus than corneal hysteresis. And uh, when you compare the deformation amplitude between the normal corneas to ecratic corneas, there's still a significant overlap. Even our own uh, data suggests that uh, it is very uh, difficult to uh, do away with the overlap because we don't have normative data as such uh, for Indian eyes and that too for pediatric Indian eyes. Now, uh, it has been suggested that keratoconus is a focal reduction in the biomechanical properties which occur first resulting in the tissue thinning as the weaker area. And this strains, uh, and then this, this strains the healthy area uh, more so subsequently it leads to the transmission of passing of this strain which leads to ectasia even in the healthy part. And it is unclear whether uh, cornea develops keratoconus due to reduced cornea hysteresis and higher deformation amplitude or corneal hysteresis is a effect of the same. So the cause effect relationship is really not known. But one thing is known is that with post refractive surgery, you can have a reduced CCT as a consequence of the procedure. They do have a reduced corneal hysteresis as well. So, uh, like I said earlier, the myomechanics has a more important role to diagnose preclinical cases of keratoconus, all those cases which are going to go into ectasia after refractive surgery rather than in frank keratoconus. So this is uh, the depiction of the subclinical ectasia just to show if it is focal and this gets transmitted onto the areas which are normal. 
and it becomes a vicious cycle. So uh, the modulus of elasticity is focally reduced and this redistributes the stress. So even in the normal area, there is stress. So this cycle, vicious cycle, it goes on. Now this is just to show that the biomechanical parameters in the healthy human eye itself in the various geographical lo location, if you see the data is not similar uh, and it is uh, different. And so uh, it is important to generate a normative data first, then to generate a normative data in various age groups, including pediatric eyes, and then to generate it in funnel um, uh, ectasias. The second instrument uh, that is uh, uh, measures biomechanics is the Pentachem Corvus ST. And very much like the way you would do a Pentachem, and uh, you can see that uh, there is a frank keratoconus here. And again, in such cases, the Corvus ST really doesn't help much because it doesn't have anything more to add to it because the bad D will always uh, will be will be norm will be abnormal. So, uh, uh, following collagen crosslinking, it does have a role, but again, uh, like I said, the uh, yet needs to be standardized by a large number of studies over uh, a long follow-up, which has not been uh, done up till now. Now, as far as the Corvus ST is concerned, there's a puff of air which goes. So the you have applanation one or the applanation length one, which is measured. Then it uh, goes at the back and then recoils again. And then you have applanation two. So basically, there are a whole lot of parameters out of which deformation amplitude is most important. And uh, that suggests uh, whether there is a, a keratoconus or not, or in fact, the subclinical form of the keratoconus. Apart from this, these are the various uh, parameters which are available on the Corvus ST, which really need to be looked at. Sorry about this. Am I going at the back or am I going in the front? So I'll come to the case scenarios because that will help to explain better. So suffice it to say that these are the various parameters and you have softer cornea if there is increase in all these parameters, uh, deformation amplitude, corneal velocity, DA ratio, inverse concave radius and integrated radius. And if you have a decrease in the parameters such as applanation length, arc length, stiffness parameters A1, ART, then you have uh, softer corneas. And arc length is especially important uh, after uh, refractive surgery. So these are the limits between 0.25 if it is less, low risk than 0.25 to 0.5 is moderate risk following which it is high risk. Now, uh, this was a study which we did in 116 eyes, uh, again, pediatric keratoconus, and we looked at our baseline uh, characteristics. They were all uh, moderate to severe uh, cases of keratoconus and some cases were also mild. And we looked at corneal biomechanics. We studied corneal hysteresis and corneal resistance factor, and there was a significant negative correlation of corneal hysteresis and corneal resistance factor uh, with the stage of the keratoconus. So this is nothing which was not expected. We had expected this. Uh, and uh, another study that we did was comparing hypoosmolar versus isoosmolar uh, crosslinking, in which we looked at the corneal biomechanics again. And uh, we found that with the isoosmolar, the corneal biomechanics uh, that improved following collagen crosslinking were far superior as compared to hypoosmolar. Although they did improve with both the procedures when we compared them preoperatively, but when we compared them between the two groups, it was better with the, uh, with the ISO or smaller group. And this was done uh, by accelerated collagen cross-linking. Now, uh, just showing two, case, two cases of keratoconus, this is mild and this is severe, same patient, but mild keratoconus and severe keratoconus um, in, the, in one eye and the other eye. And if you look at the dynamics, uh, corneal responses notice that all the uh, deformation amplitude, the applanation length, the arc length are decreased more in the eye which has severe keratoconus as compared to the one which has mild. But if you look CBI, TBI and BAD parameters, BAD of course is five here and 14.1 here, which is severe. But CBI and TBI, if you look, there is no, not much of a difference. So this is exactly what I was saying that once you have a keratoconus, which is more than moderate, then uh, the CBI, TBI parameters are going to remain pretty much the same. And this is just to show the cornea is thinner here and it is going to dip far more in severe cases of keratoconus as compared to the uh, mild cases of keratoconus. Now, patient of VKC, seven-year-old male, uh, and it is important to see this because this is borderline CBI here, bad, which looks normal, and a TBI, which is also going into borderline uh, stage. 
and uh, if you look at the bad d here it doesn't look that bad uh, but if you look at the if you look at the cbi and the tbi again it is falling in the suspect zone so such cases are the ones where biomechanics is really going to help you and you have to follow them up over a prolonged period of time to see whether they go into frank ectasia or not and sometimes you can have pediatric keratoconus uh, symmetrical one right eye and left eye almost looks uh, symmetrical picture and then uh, bad also looks equally bad and then if you look at the uh, the biomechanics also they are also symmetrically uh, showing that uh, they are uh, pretty much abnormal it has a role to play in cases such as this where you have post lasik ectasia but again uh, in 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 such cases uh, the d value is really very high and uh, after post lasik ectasia has occurred again it will have a role to play when you want to see what happens to it when you do collagen cross linking so we've had we have about 11 eyes uh, with uh, post lasik ectasia uh, where biomechanics have been studied and uh, we are actually yet to analyze that data Uh, again in tax and cxl we tried to see what happens to biomechanics here and notice that nothing actually happens because initially it is only so severe that it has not shown improvement at all although in terms of visual acuity uh, there is improvement because central part of the cone is taken care of but not otherwise then you may do keratoplasty and i'm sure professor tikyal sir is going to talk about it this is just to show with the sutures are out the cornea becomes a little ectatic such as shown here when sutures are in the cornea is not ectatic this is a case in which uh, the sutures were removed and again you will see the same thing in the uh, biomechanics picture also that there is no ectasia here in the cbi tbi whereas there is ectasia here because the topography itself shows that uh, there is overriding of the graft host junction then again i'm talking about dalk but Uh, i think uh, as far as the corneal transplantation is concerned uh, it's not standardized at all yet but i'm sure in future we would probably need to do this now this shows a very bad uh, the bad d is not very good at all but the biomechanics are failing us in this because although cbi is showing more than borderline but in the biomechanics map here bad is showing normal and uh, tbi is showing borderline so for procedure where where surgical intervention has been taken probably uh, we've still not standardized it but uh, where mild cases are concerned form first cases are concerned or you have to uh, predict for uh, uh, cases who have to be who have to be undertaken with refractive surgery there probably biomechanics are going to play an important role so thank you very much for your kind attention Thank you, Dr. Namrata, and uh, I would just like to inform you all that uh, it's our proud privilege that we have been joined by uh, Dr. William Trattler, and uh, uh, he is a renowned refractive cornea and cataract eye surgeon at Center for Excellence in Eye Care at U.S. In addition to his private practice, he is also on the volunteer faculty at the Florida International University, Wertheim College of Medicine, as well as the University of Miami's Bascom Palmer Eye Institute. he is involved in so many uh, uh, projects has been, received so many multiple awards and has been involved in treating corneal diseases especially uh, ectasias post lasik ectasias cross linking etc so it's uh, and uh, and of course we have been doing uh, uh, webinars with dr william trattler earlier uh, at the aws level during the covid time so we welcome dr william trattler and uh, Uh, we would like to have uh, the video uh, that he would like to present so a very warm welcome to you sir no, this is a progressive thank disease thank you so what time Where is that is, is it but it's actually much more common than what was once thought and the key is that if we identify keratoconus we can actually perform cross linking to stabilize the cornea and prevent progression But it can be difficult and challenging to identify keratoconus early. Here's an, here's an example of a patient that looks pretty normal. They had a topography. Maybe they're coming in for a, for a refractory surgery consultation. They have just some slight inferior steepening. Not enough that would make this patient truly classify as keratoconus. But the patient was followed over time. They were in their 20s. They came back two years later, and now there's been a change in the shape of the cornea, where the steep part of the cornea got steeper. The flat part got even flatter. Um, And this actually now this patient has developed keratoconus. The difference map shows us clearly uh, this change that occurred over these two years. 
Um, so this patient could still be a little difficult to diagnose, especially in 2014. In uh, 2016, uh, also, even though on topography we pick it up, but they may not have had any findings on slit lamp exam. So how common is keratoconus? Well, uh, we all remember the number of one in 2000, but more recent studies have found that it's much more common. This study from the Netherlands found it was about one in 375. And here are studies from multiple other countries where the incidence or prevalence is, sorry, I meant to say prevalence, is about two to 3%. Uh, and then it's as high as almost 5% in Saudi Arabia. So again, much more common than what was once thought. But one of the challenges is that keratoconus is often discovered late. Um, the slit lamp signs of a keratoconus um, are often only visible when there's moderate to severe keratoconus. Um, and often significant, uh, significant keratoconus can progress or develop prior to vision loss. So this is really interesting. I, I've seen a number of patients, and these are not all of them, where, they, where these patients have obvious keratoconus on pentacam or, or slit lamp or on topography, uh, or tomography, whichever technology you're using. And you can see they, they have keratoconus here, uh, but they're uncorrected visual acuity in all four of these eyes was 2020. They have other examples of just like this. And they're seeing reasonably well, so they don't come in for eye exams. So it can be tough to diagnose uh, in early keratoconus. Now, once we do diagnose them, it's really critical that we consider cross-linking early because patients can be quite progressive. This young patient progressed from, from January to April 2014. The K-max got steeper. And you can see from the difference map that the steep part of the cornea got much steeper, the flat part got much flatter, so the irregular stigmatism worsened and their vision, unfortunately, declined because of this progression. So we want to catch this early. Now here's a patient in their late 40s. Some people say that once you're over 30, uh, the chance of progressing is very uncommon, and I actually disagree with that. I think it's actually much more common if you follow them carefully. And this patient had significant worsening over, over two years and 10 months in their late 40s. You can see the, the, the original ones in the middle, it came back uh, almost three years later, and the difference map shows significant steepening centrally uh, from progressive keratoconus. Now, we also want to follow a patient that had previous LASIK. This patient's right eye has already experienced post-LASIK ectasia. The left eye has this little suspicious area inferiorly, but at this point does not have ectasia. Uh, so we decided we're going to follow this patient over time. So in 2013, they had this little area inferiorly that we watched, this little uh, irregularity, uh, and they came back. Uh, we follow them every year, and finally by year five, they had progressed enough that we follow this time to crosslink. You can see that the inferior part got steeper, and the difference map shows how that, that area got much steeper compared to the baseline. So now we have crosslink av available. Uh, it's FDA approved for keratoconus and post lasik ectasia. It is still considered off label for pellucid marginal degeneration. The key is that it can actually stop the progression of keratoconus. It's quite effective, 98 to 99% successful. Uh, with one treatment. Um, and we often see improvement in the corneal shape and often improvement in vision uh, following uh, the, the cross-linking procedure. So here's a patient of mine um, that had the procedure done in 2011. Um, you can see um, over time, from 2011 to 2016, there was significant flattening. The K-max uh, improved. The difference map shows that the C part of the cornea got flatter, the flat part got steeper. The patient also experienced improvement in their vision. Now here's a patient, a 33-year-old patient, who actually at this point looks like they don't have keratoconus. It looks, their cornea uh, shows symmetrical orthogonal stigmatism, no inferior steepening, but it's actually a trick. So this 33-year-old male patient who I saw in February uh, actually already had crosslinking in 2017. They had this degree of keratoconus, and this is how they look three years later after uh, the crosslinking procedure. And you can see the difference map clearly shows how the cornea was shaped uh, over this time period. Now, What's interesting is that if you look even over more time periods, you see even more flattening. So this patient um, had cross-linking performed in 2014. They were part of a, a clinical trial. And they were at 15 months, they were significantly flatter. But then every time they kept coming back, they kept getting flatter and flatter. So over five years, they had six doctors of flattening. So in summary, uh, these are some keratoconus uh, and cross-linking pearls. We want to identify keratoconus as early as possible. Children and young adults are at high risk of progression. Patients of any age can actually undergo cross-linking. And crossing can prevent progression. Often we see improvement in vision uh, and corneal shape. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Trattler. And uh, um, will you be around for, for the whole session, Dr. Trattler? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so can we have the two talks and then maybe we can. Uh, of course, yes. Perfect. Okay, great. So next we invite Dr. Arun Jain, uh, who will be talking about visual rehabilitation in keratoconus by various contact lenses.
uh, uh, thank you, Rajesh, for having uh, me on this uh, instruction course. One, uh, can you see my screen? Sir, please click on share screen, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Going on, sir. Sorry, I just started from the last line. Okay, sorry. So, all right. So, uh, I'm going to talk about the visual rehabilitation in keratoconus uh, by various uh, contact lenses. It's not moving forward. Click, okay. click or center, sir. Yeah. So, uh, as we know from the global consensus on keratoconus and actitis diseases paper, the management of algorithm. So, whatever procedure you do, whether it's a CXL or you do a uh, some sort of uh, uh, what we call uh, in uh, segments or anything. For visual rehabilitation, we have to prescribe some sort of uh, spectacles or uh, contact lenses. And depending upon the uh, degree of uh, keratoconus or the K reading, uh, different contact lenses are indicated. Once the K readings are 45 or flatter than 7, you may go on with the uh, simpler type of uh, contact lenses. If the K rating is little on the uh, curvature is more, then maybe rose K2 is indicated. Once the K rating is between six to seven millimeter, the ordinary lenses doesn't work so well. And we have to uh, use specialty lenses like rose K2 or hybrid lenses. And once the keratoconus advances much more, like five to six uh, base curve or the K rating, you have to resort to uh, advanced uh, rose K2 or scleral lenses. And what about, we have talked so much about the uh, corneal collagen cross-linking. So what about fitting contact lenses after a cross-linking procedure? As we all know, there are no clear-cut recommendation regarding whether when it is safe to resume contact lens via after corneal cross-linking, but it is usually done six months uh, post C3R. But if we have done an epi on uh, C3R, we can resort to use of contact lenses maybe at three months time, because as we all know, the K reading as well as corneal thickness keeps on changing approximately till six to nine months after C3R. So I will be emphasizing basically on rose K and uh, scleral lenses because the shortage of time, it is difficult to cover all the types of lenses way back 15 years ago, we published this uh, Rose K contact lens paper uh, in IGO. And as we all know, the standard lenses designed with fixed uh, optical zone diameter don't fit to the cone shape of the keratoconus. corners. And the standard lens uh, in that we have an unwanted pooling uh, uh, and a peripheral bearing seal off, uh, which cause a lot of problem. Rose K have a smaller optical zone uh, and it fit to the cone contour and there's no pooling and even distribution of tears are there. So I won't go into the fitting philosophy that you all know, depending upon the K rating, we start with the trial lens, which is either 0.2 millimeter steeper or same K or 0.4 millimeter uh, flatter. And uh, size is determined uh, depending upon the horizontal visible RS diameter as well as the peripheral aperture and the fit is most important because uh, that is what uh, makes the patient comfortable otherwise the discomfort is there first we have to see that the central there should be gentle apical central touch and then there is will be should be a mid peripheral bearing of the rose scale lens and most important is the peripheral uh, edge lift which should be around 0 0.75 to 1 millimeter and as you can see in this case, this is a very flat fit with the central bearing. And this is too steep a fit with the mainly peripheral, mid peripheral bearing and very minimal edge lift. 
and uh, you should have a dynamic uh, assessment of uh, uh, fit. Patient should be blinking. As you can see, immediately after blinking, you can see a little bit of uh, central bearing when there is a pulling away. So you let the lens settle down and then do it. So, so this is a okay fit in this case. And the edge should lift is very important because if it is less, then there is a lesser exchange of tear which uh, hampers the uh, corneal health. And then you finalize the total diameter and do over reflection and add on to the uh, basic uh, lens power. And that's how you prescribe these lenses. And this is a representative phase with great three to four carato corners on both sides. And this we have fitted. Uh, there is a central scarring in this case, but these lenses, as you can see, they are flat in both the eyes. And by doing a trial, more trial of the lenses, you can have a central bearing with the mid peripheral bearing and a because these are toric fit, so you can see a dumbbell shaped pulling of the dye. So, coming to the spiral contact lenses, we have experience with this valley contact custom stable spiral contact lenses. And this is the lens in not this has a central clearance zone, uh, which should be 150 to 250 micron uh, clearance from the cornea. Then we have a mid peripheral limbal independent transfer zone, and this. Uh, offers an independent customization of the limbal clearance and it should be around 50 to 100 micron uh, uh, clear of the cornea and then we have a scleral landing zone an angle that aligns on the sclera and bearing sector of the lens if on this uh, scleral bearing landing zone the lens rests on the sclera and we have two types oblate and prolate type prolate are ideal for ectatic cornea and all forms of keratoconus. And uh, this is how you uh, go about uh, changing the lensing depending upon whether the clearance is less or more. You can move in 100 micron steps so to have an optimal central clearance. And to have a, uh, the limbal independent transfer zone adjustment, these are available in 15 micron steps. And uh, then the screal landing zone, uh, it is uh, again available in 30 micrometer steps. So you should have an optimal uh, uh, screal landing zone adjustment so that there is no impingement or excessive elevation. So I won't uh, bother you with the fitting philosophy of the lens. Uh, you should have a clearance of around uh, 200 microns, uh, wait for the lens to settle and then assess that uh, whether there is a, a good clearance between 200 to 300 microns. And uh, uh, the limbal clearance uh, should also be evaluated and tuned so that you have a 50 to 100 micron of post settling, which is ideal. And uh, this is a landing zone evaluation after a settling of the lens. And zero, this marks indicates the flat meridian of the lens. And uh, this is a little uh, tilted around 20 plus uh, degree uh, right rotation. So once uh, all the parameters are settled and you are satisfied, we over refract and then uh, uh, prescribe the lens. This is just to show on OCT that this is the 50-50 uh, rule. There is half of the uh, edge uh, lens is uh, impinging on the sclera and half of it is above it. Uh, and uh, this is too much of edge lift in the middle. And the last one is digging in. This should not be done. And the uh, first one is a very good alignment. Second one is the uh, edge lift or flare, what we call. And third one on the lower side, show there is an impingement on the sclera. And this is a representative case with the uh, grade two keratoconus on the right side and grade four on the left side. And we can assess the fitting on the cassia. Uh, OCT also, you can see there is a uh, clearance of around 235. And this is another case showing uh, uh, this thing of clearance of 300 micron. And this is the bilateral both eye fitting with the, this scleral contact lens. Patient again, almost 6669 vision in both the eyes. And this is another case you, here you see uh, zone, clearance zone is around 180 micron. 
and this is post keratoplasia and uh, you can adjust uh, just uh, this is the last line so uh, the clearance zone uh, you can adjust depending upon the uh, fitting philosophy so to conclude whatever stage of keratoconus you have various modalities of treatment we have already discussed in the course of instruction course uh, next uh, dr tetyal will be talking about the choice of keratoplasty but whatever procedure you do you do you need to uh, optically rehabilitate this patient with either spectacles or contact lenses thank you so much for the patient hearing thank you sir for a very nice presentation on contact lenses in keratoconus which is really the mainstay as far as the management of keratoconus is concerned and we have discussed so many management uh, options and uh, uh, now we will be discussing about the decision making on keratoplasty in keratoconus and i request professor tetyal professor j s tetyal to present on decision making on keratoplasty in keratoconus Yeah, uh, thank you, Rajesh. Uh, can you hear me, Rajesh? Yes, sir. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, getting me into this course. Uh, wonderfully uh, covered the, all the aspects of keratoconus beautifully. We all know uh, keratoconus is a disease where uh, we are all working to prevent patient reaching up to the stage where surgery has to be done. And uh, yes, there are some uh, instances now even also require a surgery, like especially stage four keratoconus. when you have uh, uh, steeper cornea thin corneas and scarring where other alternatives which we had discussed earlier may not be feasible in those cases so these are cases like a large central scar post hydrops or a very very steep cornea thin uh, less than 250 microns or central scarring not adequately correctable with contact lens or a spectacles intolerance and visual acuity of patient not up to the mark This is a study we published long time back, 2010. Uh, I think it still holds to the risk factors uh, for a keratoplasty. We found a patient has a hydrops. The chances of surgery increases many, many fold. Therefore, eye rubbing, history of atopy, also associated with a high risk of uh, hydrops, will have higher chances of getting into a surgical aspects. In our study, we found five percent patient having a family history. Early onset of a disease, uh, history of eye rubbing, uh, BKC, uh, steeper cornea, thin corneas, lower vascular visual acuity, corneal scarring, hydros were all associated risk factors to uh, get into patient for a surgery as such. What are the options uh, we decide on? Uh, what basic parameters? There are three important parameters on which uh, friends we have to decide what surgery has to be done: the so central corneal scarring, thickness or thinness of cornea. And the uh, involvement of uh, cornea in terms of scarring the visual axis. So these three important points are there. So if you have deep central scarring, excessive corneal thinning, and desmoid scarring, disease endothelium, you have to consider full thickness keratoplasty for such patient. But if a keratometry uh, is, is not that steep and your corneal thickness is more than two fifty microns, and you can't do other procedures, then you may have to do a dark in such cases. Very thin corneas. You have option of doing a either dark or manual dark in these patients to achieve a successful result, not to damage the endothelium in such cases. Peripheral involvement of uh, cornea that means a uh, very advanced keratoconus. You may have to do a tuck-in level keratoplasty in such case. For a full thickness keratoplasty, it is very important to have a good examination in terms of a cone size, the thickness of a, a cone, and accordingly measure the size when you are going to define to find it. General anesthesia will be preferred in such cases because surgery can be lo longer. If needed, you must put a flaringa ring also. Suction to find will give you a better option for such cases. Uh, after you achieve a suction, go clockwise rotation till you see your beads of aqueous coming up. So I rotate clockwise unless I see the beads of aqueous coming up. Stop the suction at this time. Then subsequently, uh, you can uh, cut the remaining corneal tissue with uh, corneal skull scissors. See how effectively you have reached almost 90% of uh, cornea. Then subsequent uh, release of a little bit of thin uh, stroma is very easy, and you have a very effective definition. Uh, it's very important to have a hypotony and not to damage the underlying structure. That is a lens which is normally clear. Put a, a viscoelastic 
then do a suturing these cases the graft host disparity should not be kept more than 0.25 in fact if it is the same size it will be better and we normally prefer an interrupted suture in most cases but you can have interrupted and one single running or you can have a double running sutures and uh, each surgeon should adequately titrate the amount of astigmatism they get after a uh, uh, keratoplasty in keratoconus most of the time the results are uh, very good because there's no interface you get a very good uh, optical quality the only uh, problem with full thickness graft is a slightly higher incidence of graft rejection in these cases which may amount to be a 16 to 20% rejection rate endothelial rejection at the end of one year which is definitely much more than a, a partial thickness surgery like a dal where the incidence may be less than 3 or 4% and the recovery after a rejection in a stromal rejection in a dal is very very fast and uh, recover to normal while it may not hold true for endothelial rejection of full thickness graft so therefore i think it's only when it is classically indicated like a very big central scar or very thin cornea which is not amenable to a dal should be considered for penetrating graft as such these are some post op results of patients They're doing very well subsequently what about doing a dal uh, i think in all keratoconus uh, if you can achieve a uh, desmetic dal the results will be as good as uh, full thickness grafts in terms of avoiding interface in these cases therefore big bubble unwash technique is uh, classically described after having a 70 to 80 percent definition i do a little paracentesis inject a few bubbles inside there will be indicator for a big bubble formation you see the two central bubbles i'm trying to form the big bubble with uh, 26 gauge needle bent downwards you can say bubble has formed centrally therefore the central bubble has shifted to periphery so there's a indication that big bubble is forming i'll increase the bubble pressure so that i reach up to the definition mark which i said around 70% please your uh, this thing now i have an entire and dissect the remaining stoma it should be open uh, dissection as such subsequent to dissection we are going to release this uh, central bubble the space has to be replaced by the viscoelastic normally i use 1% sodium hyaluronate you will see as soon as we make a central nick you can see i am making a nick here this peripheral bubble will shift to center So there's a release of big bubble. We, I know that release has occurred. The desmet had shifted back to stoma. Now we'll refill with the viscoelastic the space, and the central bubble will again shift to periphery. And you can subsequently do a four quadrant take uh, uh, stromal cut in these cases to expose the desmets clearly in the and re remove the entire disease uh, stromal tissue in a keratoconus patient. So it is very important to remove entire disease stromal tissue right from the center. up to the periphery therefore initial definition mark should include the normal healthy cornea also so once you remove the total uh, uh, stoma you can uh, do a suturing with a normal cornea which is optical grade better if you don't have optical grade you can use a non optical grade also in such cases so if you have a ioct microscope that can assist you to really do a good job in a big bubble dark but it is much more beneficial in a layer by layer dissection in cases where you have a central scar also and the tilt is required in a very very large cone so you may create a globus type of thing where you make a peripheral pocket to insert the uh, donor tissue there which has a good uh, uh, result in a larger uh, size cones in a keratoconus recently people talk about bowman's membrane uh, transplantation in a uh, dissection into the anterior stoma the results are encouraging in some cases by stenching the uh, uh, tissue stents and decreasing the progression sutureless procedure less invasive maybe this becomes a fuse rajesh talked about various techniques to incorporate a lenticule inside the pocket uh, with uh, cross linked or non cross linked that may also be future for a keratoplasty to be avoided in these cases so how do we make a decision making as i said again the intact or desmet membrane and endothelium thickness will decide what type of procedure going to do thicker cornea you have cross linking as a uh, this thing less than 380 where you can't do cross linking dark may be appreciable good option but if you have tear scar then for thickness graft if the scar is peripheral you might again attempt a dark procedure in these cases to summarize keratoplasty is still needed in a some group of cases of keratoconus dark is a uh, should be preferred than a full thickness if possible and desmetic dark will give a better optical results Keratoplasty, yes. If you have central scar where dal cannot be done, should be done. 
and newer techniques of uh, Bowman's membrane transplantation uh, may be future or tissue assistant, uh, cross-linked tissue assistant will be the future for a most keratoplasty replacement in keratoconus patient. Thank you, Rajesh, for getting me into this course and wonderfully conducted. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot for a wonderful presentation on decision making as far as keratoplasty is concerned in keratoconus. And uh, now uh, the, the, we can have a discussion on uh, this topic. Uh, any any uh, issue that uh, any panelist feels like uh, you know talking about? Or I think I uh, you you got everything covered very beautifully right from the beginning, Rajesh. And I'd like, like to uh, have, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, yes Dr. Okay. Okay. Can I ask one thing? Uh, do you sure, have sure. Any, any experience in doing uh, this keratoplasty in post uh, cross linked eyes? How they do the <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. You know, uh, we hope that we don't have to do keratoplasty in these cases. But the initial stage where we are doing cross-linking uh, in some group of cases where we did not get an adequate uh, effect of cross-linking, maybe the, the techniques were not appropriate at that time. You, uh, we did uh, one or two uh, uh, dark in such cases. In fact, dal was easier in those cases than our routine cases because the posterior part of stroma is still uh, loose in these cases. So it is the anterior stroma which is cross-linked. So dark normally does not make a difference. You can achieve good uh, bubble and you can easily do dark in these cases. So not much a difference. I have done ICRS in these, uh, like in tax in uh, post uh, cross yes, yeah. And there, you know, after using femtosecond laser also, I had to use the spatula to separate. So, so it is a little tough, you know, creating the channel even after femtosecond laser in cross-linked corneas. Dr. Tratla, would you like to comment on that? Uh, I, I know these are great comments. I, um, great comments so far. I, I don't have a lot of experience in, in, uh, with crossing corneas in that situation. Oh, but uh, in those cases of crossing corneas, which do have some amount of corneal haze, I think a couple of them we have done where we had to do a salk sort of a procedure, so superficial anterior lamellar keratoplasty because of the haze that was there uh, superficially. Also, in these cases, I think, uh, uh, I don't know, I think you must have discussed, Rajesh, but the biosynthetic, uh, biosynthetic lenticule as well as the synthetic lenticule also plays a very important role. And the advantage of a synthetic vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the biological tissue is that it doesn't thin out over a period of time. So there are two groups who are working at it, uh, one from uh, Switzerland and the other from uh, Sweden. And... Uh, this is the advantage that it will not thin out over a period of time, unlike a human tissue, which will thin out over a period of time. Uh, even the human tissue uh, donor lenticule, uh, people have used, uh, they have done cross-linking on that. And so those lenticules have been found to be stiffer when introduced intrastromally. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they have thinned out lesser than... The only problem with the synthetic lenticules is the cost and the yes. availability. They are quite expensive. Any, any comment on customization of uh, cross-linking, customized cross-linking? So I think you need to have special machine for that, which I think only Swapna. Swapna, you are working with uh, Shwain? Yeah. Yeah. I, I am working with Shwain. Uh, uh, so uh, there you can mask certain areas of the cornea or focus the uh, laser on certain spots. You can uh, pre-program it topographically using the series before you do the... Uh, PTK and uh, yeah, but, you know. we need to have that software, but I think not all machines are capable of doing customized cross linking. Dr. Trattler wants to say something, yeah. please. That Schwinn one, one is only for PTK. You customize for PTK. Uh, the delivery system is uh, a standard one only. The UV delivery system is standard only. The only the PTK part, uh, it picks up from the topography map, and we can have a uh, different shapes, oval, uh, round, or whatever. Avedro, I think, had a program where uh, you could selectively. Yeah. Uh, See, that's a mosaic. They, they had a, the Avedro 2 pixel mosaic. Uh, somehow they are not, uh, they did only trials in India, two or three machines. After that, they yeah. took the machines back, and there is no machine available in India. 
Dr. Tratler, you Dr. Tratler wants to say something, yeah. I was just going to share that with a regular device, you can still customize because you don't have to treat the center. You can decenter towards the thinnest part of the cornea, and especially in Pellucid, I have the patient look way up and treat the bottom part of the cornea, which is the weakest. And you'll see some really nice reshaping when they do it that way. So don't just always treat the center, find the weakest spot, and that's where I typically center my UV light treatment. That's what Dr. Reddy was showing that, you know, that he, used, he covered the area which was thick which was stronger and he cross-linked the thin areas. So covered it with, with, with some, uh, some paper, some uh, cellulose. Yeah, that's a glove paper. <laughs> glove paper. Okay. okay. Dr. So, Reddy, I just wanted to ask you uh, regarding the control you use, the glutaraldehyde uh, cornea along yes, with the rest. Yes. Could you please uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, that's what we are looking at. Uh, uh, KOH digestion. We can do enzyme digestion, KOH. Enzyme digestion is uh, very expensive and it's very uncontrolled. KOH is very easy and uh, easily can find out uh, how strong is the tissue. So we use 20% KOH and we are doing, uh, we cross-linking different strength of riboflavin and uh, looking at the, it's very simple. We can just keep it in our room and every half an hour we have to go and have a look at it or 10 minutes what's happening. We can put our fellow sit there with the chair and they can keep on. For glutaraldehyde is taking almost uh, 24 hours. For uh, uncross-linked uh, one, it is getting digested uh, within two hours, 20%. For cross-linked one, uh, uh, nearly four hours. Actually, I thought that the cross-linking immediately doesn't produce uh, any effect of stiffening. I want to prove but uh, I proved myself wrong, so I didn't further. So my aim is just to take the cross-linking button, do cross-linking, then immediately wash with the BSS, and then for 20 minutes we kept in BSS all the ones, then subject to do KOH uh, digestion. So I want to prove that cross-link doesn't happen with the riboflavin. What we are seeing is a inflammatory phenomenon, uh, but they do happen, and uh, there is a we repeated many uh, same I don't arrive. We repeated, but the result is the same. So uh, now, uh, JK, uh, just one question uh, for thin corneas. We discussed so many options. You know, people have done so many uh, innovations, like yes, using sir. soft contact lens, using the uh, tissue over the cornea, now tissue under in the pocket, and other ways to uh, look into what is would be the right uh, way to do it in today's yes. time. Sir, I, I asked for the same thing when in uh, Dr. Rohit uh, meeting. He said right in the beginning, I given a graph for energy. I calculated for the volume of the tissue, the energy necessary. Mm -hmm. Why you are doing this, I can't understand, he's telling. I think so. You, just, you, you yeah. just reduce the energy level because I calculated the energy for the volume of the corneal tissue. So if the volume of the corneal tissue is less, uh, we have to use less. I have given this graph 12 years back, he's saying. But no, somehow so. nobody, see the inventor, yeah. nobody is uh, speaking because he is not ophthalmologist. Mm -hmm. We are talking among ourselves. He is a basically a chemist so and a physicist. So we are not. Uh, uh, I think head so. okay, apart that, apart that from the paper, energy, it is the you know thickness of a tissue, which is also, you know. But I think so that, is paper is all, the endothelium. Yeah, that paper is already published uh, where they are not going to use the same amount of energy. But they have titrated the energy as per the thickness of the cornea. I think uh, Dr. Hafezi has very recently, last month, only published that paper. So you don't need, you don't have to be 400 microns at the bottom. It can be 300, but your energy will change. Yeah. Or energy will uh, decrease so that it doesn't. Uh, energy or time, anything we can total yeah. energy delivered, we can reduce it by adjusting the time. Yeah. Or if your mission doesn't allow. Uh, five point some machines they don't allow just press four point five point four it will come so then just cut off few minutes before we take off the patient i think i guess can... i guess we will have to stop now because uh yeah next session is up <laughs> so thank you i would like to thank all the uh co-instructors professor Tital, professor Runjan, dr jk reddy dr swapnanar professor namrata sharma dr vijay sharma and special thanks to our guest dr william Trattler. And thank you all. And thank I would like to thank the hall coordinator for making everything smooth. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. Uh, thank you, Rajesh. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Excellent course.
Thank you. Thank you, Thank ladies you and gentlemen, much. for joining us.